Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tech Takeoff. My name is Matt Call. I'm a product manager on the Microsoft Intune team, and I'm responsible for endpoint security. With me today is uh, Josh, Josh from the Defender for Endpoint team. Josh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so my name is Josh Bregman. I'm a product manager on the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint team, as Matt said, and I focus on tamper protection and tamper resiliency. And we've got a great session for, uh, for you guys today. Let's uh, take a look at the agenda. So first, Matt is going to take us through Microsoft and Zero Trust. He's going to talk about the unified endpoint security management experience. Then I'm going to take uh, folks through uh, some thoughts on TAP resiliency. And finally, we're going to have some calls to action. So uh, Matt, why don't you uh, take it away and talk about Zero Trust? Love to. So first off, let's frame this Zero Trust thing in terms of how Microsoft thinks about protecting endpoints and user identities. From the Microsoft Intune side, we are heavily invested in the device protection story, but that's only one piece of the story. When we talk about Zero Trust and Intune, and we talk about how Zero Trust affects identity planes and how we protect resources and assets, it's really important for devices to uh, have the same identity infrastructure, the same identity assertions as users, right? I have this good quote that I heard somewhere at one point, which is, you know, only when I have a durable identity for both a user and a device can I start to understand how my users and devices are accessing resources. And this is really important because some organizations uh, tend to focus over pivot or focus on user identity, and they forget about the device aspect of the implementation, right? They forget about the device having, uh, needing to attest when we access resources and needing to sort of give that context aware to the authentication transaction, which is really important. It's not just important to know who's accessing resources, but it's important to also know where they're accessing resources from, and if that device is trusted, and how that device sort of fits into the whole uh, gambit of the authentication piece. If I just frame Zero Trust for a second here, let's talk a little bit about how Microsoft views Zero Trust and how we plan to uh, support Zero Trust as we move forward as an organization. Zero Trust has sort of three components. We start with things like strong authentication. Right. Strong authentication is using an authentication method or a credential that isn't spoofable or isn't fishable. Think about things like Hello for Business. Think about things like FIDO keys. Think about things that users know, but they also have. Next, we think about adaptive access. And for us, that aligns closely with something that we have internal at Microsoft through the Microsoft Entra team known as conditional access. Conditional access allows you to define a rich set of compliance policies or a rich set of uh, you know, compliance rules or conditional access rules. So when a user goes to access a resource, you can check that access request in real time, requiring things like multi-factor authentication, requiring things like, is the device compliant and is the device managed? Requiring things like, uh, you know, when it comes from inside of your network boundary, having different requirements from when it's outside the network boundary. And all of this can be pivoted based on the resource you're accessing. So you can have different rules based on the resource. I might have specific rules for things like Outlook Web Access and SharePoint online, but I might have different rules for an internal uh, line of business application that holds really sensitive data, right? Different gates that are funneled through the Microsoft Entra auth chain. So it's really important uh, with Zero Trust that, you know, as I said before, it's not just the user that's coming through the authentication chain, but when that authentication happens, I want to have a rich set of properties and context about the device. So that way I can make the right decision when that resource access takes place. And then lastly, and the one that we're going to focus on a little bit today uh, is endpoint management, right? Uh, it's not enough to just secure uh, all this stuff with conditional access or secure, you know, the runtime access request. We also need to secure the device and make sure that I have a steady, secure platform to build upon. So that way, uh, I know the state my device is in. I can uh, assert trust of that state, uh, and I can use that to gate access to resources. Well, those are the three sort of implementation pillars. Zero Trust or Microsoft's view of Zero Trust is based on three principles. Verifying explicitly, using least privilege access, and assuming breach, right? And we do that primarily through the two uh, facets that I talked about. Again, user and device. I wanna protect the identities that the user is authenticating with and the device is authenticating with. And then I wanna protect the endpoints, right? 
having the right policy enforcement, a uniform policy of for enforcement across the estate. So that way I know exactly what state my device is in. I feel good about that state. And when something changes, uh, I can change or I can impact that resource access at runtime. So we're gonna focus a little bit on endpoint management now, right? So from the endpoint management side of the house, there's a few different aspects that we can roll into our zero trust methodology. First, we wanna be able to detect and respond to threats. And when threats are inside of our environment, we need maybe a little extra, right? And Josh is gonna talk about how Tampa resilience can provide a little bit above and beyond a normal secure configuration. And then the second thing we're gonna talk about is gonna be that secure configuration piece. How can I make sure that when devices are in my enterprise or they're managed by Microsoft Intune, that I can go ahead and get all the same configurations in a uniform standard way across my device estate? And we really refer to this as unified endpoint security management or unified endpoint management, one of those two concepts. So we'll talk a little bit about how those things uh, work together. Both of these contribute to the assume breach aspect of uh, zero trust, and that's really important. They could, they could contribute to both verify explicitly, right? I make sure my device is in the right state uh, before I grant access to that resource. Or I, it could also contribute to use least privilege access, right? Where I, I have a device that is uh, locked down. I have users who have lower privileges than what they need potentially, or they're running with a least privilege model. So that way they have only what they need and they only have those sort of privileges or those elevated privileges when they need them, right? So run with least privilege. So now let's focus on unified endpoint security management. So from the Microsoft Intune and Microsoft Defender for endpoint point of view, our goal is to break down silos. We want IT and security teams to work together. What we find in most enterprises is security is defining policy, responding to threats uh, in the moment, and our IT ops teams are the ones deploying configuration and managing the steady state of the enterprise. We wanna make sure that these two teams are working together but on top of working together, it's also important that these IT teams provide, uh, or IT and security teams provide visibility to one another. IT can see what configurations are coming down to a device for things like troubleshooting activities, so on and so forth. And security teams have context around when a device was last checked in, which apps are targeted and deployed to these devices. It's really important that the context from both of those spaces work together, so that way both of those teams can be more efficient. We believe that the first time IT and security should meet, it shouldn't be deep down at the device. We shouldn't impact the user experience. IT and security should meet in the service, being able to see each other's configurations and also being able to collaborate to provide a more uniform and secure experience across the board. On top of that, we wanna make sure that our tools promote this sort of seamless integration and frictionless experience. And that's where we focus a lot of our effort in as of late. So when we talk about unified endpoint management, we really talk about getting into the Microsoft Intune plane in two discrete manners. The first is what you know today from Microsoft Intune and Endpoint Configuration Manager, allowing you to manage everything on a device, whether that's app deployments, that's PowerShell script deployment, that's software updates, any set of configurations, allowing you to do management on these devices, regardless of platform type. We support an array of platforms, everything from Windows Client, uh, to iOS and Android, Mac OS, Windows Server. We have a rich set of capabilities around management. But for those devices that aren't managed by my normal management plane, you know, my majority management plane in the estate, I still have the need to deploy security configurations. We've worked with the Defender for Endpoint team to build security management for Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, which allows you to deploy uh, common security configurations like antivirus, uh, endpoint detection response, and firewall settings uh, to these devices without needing them to be fully managed or fully enrolled. This allows you to make sure that you have a secure, consistent configuration across your entire estate. The power of this lends itself to one example. Say I have an AV policy that I deploy to 99% of my Windows 10 clients. This policy is my secure state, my steady state for AV configuration, but I have a set of devices, let's just call them uh, devices in my DMZ uh, that aren't fully managed, they're half on, half off the corporate network, but I protect those devices with Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. With this scenario, I can go ahead and onboard those devices to Defender for Endpoint, and without the presence of the uh, Microsoft Intune management layer, they will go ahead and automatically or seamlessly enroll the Defender for Endpoint client into Intune. Now, 
when that happens, that allows me to distribute the same AV policy that I deployed to 99% of my Windows 10 clients to these devices, making sure that I have a steady AV state, a steady AV configuration, gives me the flexibility to do things like deploy exclusions only to these devices because they're a special use device. It brings them into the single place for management, for security management, which is the endpoint security blade in uh, Microsoft Intune. This allows the visibility and the response actions to deploy configurations seamlessly without any additional need to go into another tool uh, direct for your IT professionals in the pane of glass that they're used to using. But it's just not enough sometimes for secure configurations to be present. Sometimes we need to go above and beyond. So Josh is going to talk a little bit about tamper resilience and how that plays into our story and how we can use tamper resilience to build, a, I guess, a higher security standard or a higher base. Right, Josh? So when I think about tamper resilience, what we're really talking about is providing an added layer of protection around a key set of security settings in Microsoft Defender antivirus. And what we want to make sure here is that even when customers are using Microsoft Intune to set the configuration, that um, there's an added layer of control so that uh, the threat actors can't you know, override those settings or put the, the Defender antivirus in a state which is going to leave it open to compromise. And so I think this is a really good example of how security uh, and IT can work together to keep their endpoints safe. So let me go into a, a sort of quote that I think helps explain how important the things that Matt and I are talking about today are to a zero trust approach and keeping endpoints safe. So this is a quote from our latest Microsoft cybersecurity signals in August from Emily Hacker, who's one of our big security researchers. And what she says here is that ransomware in general is uh, an avoidable disaster. And that when we look at the data, we see that 80% of ransomware attacks are exploiting configuration errors. So this just underscores how important it is in the face of ransomware, which is the thing that everybody is really worried about from a security perspective, how important configuration is. So that if you do in fact centrally manage your configuration to make sure that it is what you need it to be, and then can ensure that in the face of a, of a motivated attacker, that you can actually keep that configuration enabled, then you've got a much better chance of uh, being in the right configuration, not only sort of at a management time, but also at runtime. And that's ultimately going to keep you safe and well protected from these attacks like ransomware. So what are we really talking about here? What we're talking about is tamper protection. So tamper protection is a feature of Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. And what it really does is it prevents, uh, we'll call them configuration errors from happening. And so a configuration here, error here could be uh, accidental, just um, someone doesn't realize the importance of these security settings, or it could in fact be something more malicious. Uh, a threat actor uh, has knowledge that these settings are sort of important and they're taking some action directly to compromise the admin intent of having Microsoft Defender antivirus well secured. And so when tamper protection is enabled, what it does is it prevents these settings from being turned out from their default state. And those defaults are set by the product team. And we believe that those are things that um, should be set in the default state to keep people safe. Probably the most notable one here is having real-time protection enabled. So if you're using Microsoft Defender antivirus, real-time protection is effectively the scanning, the active scanning and protection that the antivirus system provides. And it's the thing that um, wants to be on. And it's the thing that oftentimes uh, bad guys want to turn off. And so what tamper protection will do here, you can see on the right hand side here, you can actually see that it's grayed out. It's grayed out locally on the device. And that's so a way of indicating that you can, in fact, locally change the setting. It is a protected setting. It is centrally managed. And additionally, it is tamper protected, which means while tamper protection is on, uh, real-time protection, as long as these other important settings are not going to be able to be moved outside of the default state. And so this is, I think, uh, an important part of the zero trust strategy as it's sort of trust but verify. It's an additional layer of protection to ensure that these key settings for Microsoft Defender antivirus are enabled. And you know, as Matt talked about, tamper protection itself can be and should be configured from Microsoft Intune. You can see here it's in the Windows Security Experience. And it's a simple policy. It's easy to set. And once it's uh, turned on, 
uh, then tamper protection is on and all of those additional controls uh, are in place. This added layer of protection is enabled. It's also a setting that we um, are working actively to get turned on by default. So it's on by default for all new customers and we're working um, to continue to turn it on for existing customers. But that, so we feel strongly that it should be on, but there's always gonna be, as you know, Matt mentioned, there's gonna be in large enterprises, uh, segments, small sets of devices, a lab environment, for example, where you might not want to have tamper protection turned on. And uh, this is a great way to do that through Intune so that you can ensure that you've got the set of policies deployed to your device. Uh, and then you can also manage uh, the granularity at the device device group level around having tamper protection. I would say we want it to be on, so I won't say enabled, it's having it sort of disabled uh, in selective environments. Now, the one thing that is sort of a, an interesting use case in this collaboration between IT and security and comes up often around uh, conversations around tamper protection and tamper resiliency is what about troubleshooting, right? So we talked a little bit about which settings can be tamper protected and how they can't be changed, but there's a pretty common use case that I think is really important to consider in turning on these added layers of protection, which is around troubleshooting. So let's talk about troubleshooting mode, right? So the idea here behind troubleshooting mode is that we want to work together between security and IT to have a seamless experience where temporarily, based upon the need to investigate a performance issue or performance or an app compatibility issue, temporarily disable all these controls. So it's really a three-step process. Um, so the request will come into the security team. The security team will go find the device in the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Portal. And they're going to put the device into troubleshooting mode. Um, this is all fully audited. And so both the fact that the device has been put into troubleshooting mode, as well as any of the activities that the local, the local IT user is doing during troubleshooting mode are captured. It's an important part of the security control here. So uh, we also want to make sure that when we put it in troubleshooting mode, that this is not an open-ended, from a time perspective, uh, window where bad things can happen. So we really limit the protection. It can be extended up to some limit but we're really trying to limit uh, the amount of time that these devices are in troubleshooting mode because there's a specific sort of task at hand. So the second step is once the device is in troubleshooting mode, now uh, local administrators will have rights that they would not have previously had, really to turn off tamper protection and then to turn off real-time protection and then diagnose what's going on. The one thing that I would call out is that it is, seems to be a common, I would say, runbook steps and procedures to actually disable real-time protection, but we do have other tools here, the performance analyzer that you can use to diagnose performance issues. So I know that um, some recommendations are to just disable antivirus, but uh, we do provide a set of tools, and I've got a link here in the slides, to the performance analyzer tool, which we think is the right way to go diagnose a performance issue. But if you do need to put a device in the troubleshooting mode, you can, then you can turn off tamper protection, and then you can figure out what's going on. Uh, and then the key thing here is, is that any changes that are made during the troubleshooting mode window are reverted. So it's just a temporary situation for IT to go figure out like what's going on with Defender antivirus in a different state than the sort of lockdown state provided by Intune or by Tampa protection. Uh, and so it's an opportunity to understand what's going on to potentially rule out the antivirus as being a sort of performance issue or app compat issue. And then all that stuff is reverted. Uh, and then at that point, you can take the learnings from the troubleshooting exercise and uh, incorporate them back into your sort of golden policy and make sure that those are pushed back uh, going forward. Uh, common use case there would be to create uh, antivirus exclusion if you, in fact, needed to address the app compatibility or performance issue. Um, and then there's one other thing beyond sort of troubleshooting mode and tamper protection that I want to talk about with regards to tampering, and that's our attack surface reduction rules. Again, the idea here behind attack surface reduction is that there's an additional set of configuration and hardening that customers should do to help ensure that there aren't unanticipated or unauthorized changes made to the Microsoft Defender for antivirus. The attack surface reduction rules, there are 16 of them, and they cover a wide range of uh, tactics and techniques uh, related to common threat actor TTPs. But what I really want to call everybody's attention to in this talk is around what we're calling the standard attack surface reduction rules. I think that part of the challenge around managing Microsoft Defender antivirus, it's a rich product, it does lots of things, it's got lots of capabilities, but ultimately when we're trying to keep customers safe, 
Um, we need to help them focus on a smaller set of things to have on by default and on for everyone. And so we're calling these out in our standard ASR rules. This is something that we recently introduced. And then there's two here that I really want to call out, which is there's an LSAS rule, which restricts access to LSAS, which is a common technique in uh, dumping credentials. Um, obviously here, if you dump the credentials uh, and get access to them, then you can escalate privileges in a way that you weren't authorized to. Uh, and this subverts obviously a lot of the work that we're doing around zero trust. And so this is LSAT's rule um, you really wanna have turned on. There was a great blog that was recently done by our research team uh, and a lot of improvements that we're doing in this area. And then the other one that I really wanna talk about here with regards to tamper resiliency is about blocking vulnerable drivers. Uh, unfortunately, we live, in a, we live in a world where uh, drivers exist for a long time and sometimes they have vulnerabilities in them and bad guys use those vulnerabilities to do things like disable uh, the antivirus. And so we have great protections here uh, in this area. And it's one of the main ways that we do this is through our blocking vulnerable drivers ASR rule. It's part of our standard protection set. And it's something that would strongly encourage everybody to look at and get turned on. It's also worth calling out that this is the report that I'm showing from uh, Defender for Endpoint, but you can turn on these ASR rules through Intune. And so both the sort of tamper protection setting, which we talked about, as well as these ASR rules can be managed through Intune. And I think it's a great example of how um, some of these features sort of work together to make sure that the right configuration is pushed down to devices and those settings are in place, despite attackers going after Microsoft Defender antivirus in an effort to really um, subvert them. So Josh, let me ask you a question about this report. So like, say I'm an organization and... I love what you're saying about ASR rules, right? And I want to go implement this. How as an organization can I uh, basically find out the impact that I'm going right. to see from enabling these ASR rules? Yeah, I mean, so it's a great it's a great question, Matt. I mean, and I'll have this sort of slide here, but if you can click down in these rules, you get a lot of information about where these events are, are sort of happening and what the impact for ASR rules are. You can also see some of this view inside of our, let's say, secure score slash TBM, which gives you insight into sort of the impact here. And so I would say that in general, um, some of the more advanced ASR rules like that we're talking about aren't in the standard set. I think people need to be more mindful about sort of understanding the impact and planning the rollout. And we've got like a whole methodology there. But I, what I would say is that for these sort of standard rules, um, the reason why that we're putting them in this list is because we feel like we're not seeing a lot of, I'll make, well, we say positive impact. We're seeing a lot of benefit from a security perspective for having these things on, but we're not seeing, I think when you talk about impact, you're talking about maybe like um, false positives or other sort of misses or noise and things like that. And so these rules here, we feel really good about based upon the data that we're seeing. And we don't expect the customers will see significant impact from turning these things on. That having been said, we do wanna give visibility and transparency uh, to what's going on in customers' environments. And so we've got like uh, drill down reports here as well as what you can see in the uh, secure score to give people that sort of confidence that they should go and turn these rules on. Gotcha. So like if I was going to turn these things on, this report here in the Defender for Endpoint portal would just show me like, hey, this is the number of times that this rule has been tripped or this is like if I was in audit mode, maybe like this yeah. would show the number of times this rule would be tripped, right? If I had yeah. it turned on. Yeah, yeah right. that's, okay. that, that's 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 right. And so these rules do have an audit mode and that gives uh, everyone the sort of insight to see what the impact would be. I mean, what effectively we're saying though, is that we want the standard rules to be in block mode where they actually yep. do uh, intercept these potentially dangerous activities that are happening on devices. Josh, that was so much information about tamper resilience. And I know just from working with you and the team in the past, you can almost get uh, a PhD in tamper resilience and lowering your attack surface. So. You know, from your perspective, uh, what are the things that, you know, from a tamper resilience perspective that we sh customers should go do immediately or should take away from your talk uh, on tamper resilience? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, Matt, the main things that I would say is, you know, make sure that you've got a centralized configuration, that you've got these devices enrolled at Intune so you can make sure that they are centrally controlled and managed, right? Devices that aren't managed, it's hard for us to imagine that they're actually going to be safe. So I think getting them managed is sort of key. And then getting the right configurations pushed down. I would just like to call out again, the sort of make sure that tamper protection is turned on. It's sort of the most important control in the whole tamper resiliency arsenal. 
And then I would also uh, bring people's attention to the sort of standard ASR rules, get those turned on, get them in block mode. Uh, and I think that's going to leave you in a really strong foundation from a, just a general security perspective, as well as, um, you know, aligning with sort of the notion of zero trust uh, that you talked about as well. Yeah, I love how you said the standard ASR rules. I mean, at least from my perspective, working on the management side, I see so many people who say, OK, I'm going to implement ASR rules. So let me go flip on all 16 to block mode uh, because that's the right thing to do. And they they create sort of a negative user experience because they haven't uh, they haven't done their homework or they haven't looked at the reports or they haven't done something. And they've sort of created, I don't know, I'll call it a uh, I don't know the best way to say this, but I'll call it a negative connotation to ASR rules. And I love your framing around, hey, focus on the standard ones first and get those rolled out to get a base layer of protection, right? Yeah. And then like, the it, best... it, it, yeah, it's, it's very bad. And the only other thing I would say there is like, this is, this is really complicated stuff, right? And, yeah. and so I think what we're trying to do from a product perspective is try to simplify and, and yep. to try to, you know, through this opportunity to do this talk and through some of the investments that we're making in the product to sort of be clearer about like, Particularly, I think ransomware is the thing that everybody is, at least on the security side, really focused on. And it's like, there's lots of great stuff here, but if you could, you know, you could do these three things, like start with that. Um, and, and so, uh, I, I, I hear what, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I think it's great that customers want to turn this stuff on. Uh, I, I do think that, you know, as you turn on more sort of sophisticated, um, ASR rules that they do take, a uh, a set up like a, a little more of a process, a little more of an investment there. And that's all well documented. And so people should like look at the reports and be sort of just understand what the process is there. But again, we're trying to draw a distinction here between the sort of standard ones where it's like, look, you can just put those in block mode and these other ones, which are going to take a more sort of thoughtful uh, uh, experience and exercise. Yeah, right. And just sort of speak to that in addition, we have it on a bullet point here, but M365 or Microsoft 365 E3 customers now have access to Microsoft Defender for Endpoint P1, which gives you some of this insight into uh, like things like attack surface reduction rules, gives you things like tamper protection where you may not have had that before. So, you know, if you're an M365 E3 customer, you should talk with your account team or your licensing specialist or whomever. And if you're licensed for P1, or you have P1 included, which I believe most customers do at this point, uh, you should start leveraging that immediately, right? Because you start to get some of these insights so you can roll out security uh, measures in an intelligent way. So you become the hero, right? Not uh, somebody who's impacted daily work, right? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. Well, thank you everyone for attending our uh, tech talk here on tamper resilience and configuration management with Microsoft Intune. Uh, we're hoping that you are viewing some of the other sessions, you find good content here. And as always, uh, give us the feedback you have. You know, we can't fix problems or solve uh, solve different or present different solutions if we don't know about them. So be vocal, uh, help give us feedback. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. Uh, you can find us through your account team or your Microsoft representatives, uh, whatever works. Uh, we really want to help. So thank you, everyone. We really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon.